Basso continuo is something we hear about a lot in Baroque music, and it's completely essential to understanding this repertoire. If you don't know exactly what that means, it's usually the bass line of a piece with figures or figured bass to sort of indicate which harmonies you're going to be playing. If you play a sustained instrument like a cello, viola da gamba, or a bassoon, you'll play just the bass line. But if you play a chordal instrument like a harpsichord or a lute, you're going to fill out all of the harmonies indicated by the figures. I invited my friend Dylan, a great harpsichord player, to tell us a little bit more about playing continuo. So as Emily just explained, um, continuo playing is something that for, uh, for cellists and viola da gambists means playing the bass line and they, with a chordal instrument like a harpsichord or a lute, is going to fill out the, uh, the full texture above that, which is, um, which is a really important part of this music. All Baroque music uh, relies on, on this. And the reason that composers didn't write this out is they needed to have flexibility um, to accompany the soloist that they were accompanying flexibility in their dynamics and the direction and the atmosphere of the piece and all these things are things that, uh, that you can do when you're improvising an accompaniment to suit whatever the uh, soloist wants to do. So um, Emily and I will play the first movement of this Vivaldi A minor cello sonata which, um, which is in two halves, each of which repeat, and I will play the first time from a written out realization from a uh, Baron Rider edition. So it's a very good written out uh, realization, but then on the repeats I'll improvise the accompaniment so that you can hear um, how different um, that is, and afterwards I'll talk about the things you can do when you're improvising that you can't do if you're tied to the notes that are already in a realization. <laughs>
So, uh, so as you heard from that performance, the um, the repeats were really different from the first time they um, they, they came out. And um, that's because there are a lot of tools I have when I'm improvising that I don't have when I'm playing from a realization. Um, one of the biggest ones is, uh, is dynamics, which is a word that uh, doesn't get used with uh, harpsichords that often. Um, a lot of times I hear or even see in print that, um, that one of the limitations of the harpsichord is that it can't make different dynamics. Um, but that is not true. Um, it, seems, uh, it seems pretty obvious on the face of it, but one note on a harpsichord is a lot quieter than ten notes on the harpsichord. Which, uh, which might seem like cheating, but in continuo it's a really important um, phenomenon because when you're improvising you can choose how many notes you're playing. And that also means you're choosing how loudly you're playing. So, uh, so if a soloist wants, wants to bring something back and play more quietly, you can go with them, play fewer notes, and bring the dynamic back to support them. Or if they want to bring up the intensity and play something more forte than last time, then you grab a few more notes to, uh, to go with that. And that's a really important part of, um, of continual improvising is it gives you that flexibility to reflect the uh, dynamics that the soloist wants. Another important aspect of continual playing is you can affect the, um, the atmosphere that the, um, that the soloist wants. They can only play the notes that they have and they are able to do things with color and with their bow stroke or with their breath or whatever tools they have to make uh, to make expression that we don't have at the harpsichord, but um, but we can reflect it in the notes we choose to play and um, and how we hold them down. So, uh, for example, um, as as you can see, there's not a lot of information in the continuo parts, and if it just um, tells me to play uh, an A minor chord, like at the very end of this piece, I could play like this or. Um, as I played in this particular instance because Emily had a, a kind of dark and introverted ending to it, I played with a passing tone at the top, but there are a lot of gradations of that atmosphere. If it were angry, it could be or, or something like this, or if it were more tender, or something like this. These are all options that you have when you're playing continuo that um, of course, you don't have if you're just reading the notes that are that are on a page. Another aspect of music making where a continuo player can help a soloist is intonation. Believe it or not, you, a lot of you may be familiar with the problems of temperament or the um, or the idea of expressive intonation, and there are a lot of reasons why maybe a soloist might not want to place a note where it is on a keyboard, either because the keyboard's temperament makes the note sour, or because um, the soloist wants uh, wants to have an expressive edge on that note. Um, and uh, and when when I'm improvising, I can I can really minimize the prominence of those notes in my accompaniment to allow Emily to place that note where she wants. For example, in this piece, in the uh, parallel C minor section in the second system, um, my E flat is uh, is lower than would be really perfect for um, for this piece, and so I'm able to hide it in the middle of the texture so that Emily. Can put it where uh, where she wants. Right, and the reason that the note is not exactly perfect is because when you're tuning in different temperaments, which means your half steps are not all the same size, you have to make some compromises because you want certain keys to really resonate, certain chords to be pure, as we call it, and get a great sound. But you can't tune a harpsichord perfectly for every piece, so there are going to be some notes that aren't sounding perfectly in tune. But on something like a string instrument or a voice, you can change the tuning of any note at any time. So that's a situation where you give priority to the more flexible instrument to really tune that note, and the harpsichord has to sort of accommodate that. That's right. But that's a subject for another video. <laughs> another area of music making where a continual player can have a big impact if he's improvising the accompaniment is in, uh, is in gesture or in, in, in the direction that the music is going. Um, the harpsichord can't make a crescendo on one note. Um, I mean, our notes all um, pop at the beginning and then die out. And so in order to give direction or something, you need to bring in more notes to make the gesture work. And um, that means that a lot of phrasing is written into a realization without even our realizing it um, because if, uh, because if in this piece we have a measure of three where my realization has a dotted half note, that means it's a decrescendo. 
maybe Emily doesn't want a decrescendo, and if I'm going to reflect what she's doing, that means I need to have the flexibility to bring in more notes that aren't on the page to, uh, to grow with her if she wants to do that, or if not, then to just let it die out the way it naturally would. Yeah, and that's really, it makes such a big difference as a soloist to have a continual player that's sensitive to that, because as you might have noticed from the first time through when Dylan was using the realization that was already written, there was a lot of space kind of hanging in the air, and as a soloist, I want to feel like Dylan is participating with me, like he's pushing me onto the next phrase. Um, he needs to give me space as well, but you don't want to feel sort of left alone by your continual player, and having that improvisatory quality to help with the phrasing really helps your soloist as well. Yeah, thank you. I hope that's, um, that's helpful to give you an idea for the kinds of um, things that continual players are, are working with when they're playing for you, or, um, or the things that are um, available to you if you're a keyboard player who's considering learning continuo and maybe just reading from, reading from a lot of realizations now, then um, I really can't encourage it strong enough. It gives you a flexibility that you just um, can't have otherwise. And it's um, the most fun, I think, that a keyboard player can have. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I love bringing guests like Dylan on the channel and really expanding the content. If you like stuff like this, be sure to subscribe as I do new videos every week. And if you want to help support the channel and bring more guests, you can become my patron on Patreon.